Hello, I'm Roger Rush, minister for the 6th and Washington Street's Church of Christ in Marietta, Ohio, and I'll be leading our study again today. We are resuming in Mark chapter 11, verse 1. I'll be using as the basis of this study the New American Standard Bible. I want to urge you to get your Bible and be prepared to follow along as we read and discuss the Scriptures as you're doing that. I will also remind you that we are, barring unforeseen circumstances, presently meeting here on the corner of 6th and Washington Streets at 10 a.m. Sunday mornings and at 7 p.m. Wednesday evenings. We're urging all who are ill to stay at home, and those who are uneasy may find it best to stay at home at this time also. But if you'd like to join us, we would be happy to have you in our assemblies. We're taking precautions due to COVID-19 trying to provide a safe environment for us to fulfill the command and example of the early church to assemble upon the first day of the week around the Lord's table. If you'd like to be a part of that assembly, uh, please join us again at 10 a.m. Sunday morning and for our Bible study Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. as we continue a study of personal evangelism. Now let's turn our text to today's study. Mark chapter 11 beginning in verse 1, and you'll find the parallels in Matthew 21 and in Luke 19. The text begins, and as they approached Jerusalem, they being Jesus and his disciples and the crowd that's accompanying them, as they approached Jerusalem at Bethphage and at Bethany, Bethphage is the place or house of dates, or figs, pardon me, and Bethany, the house of dates, according to Burton Kaufman, and uh, they're located both on the Mount of Olives. And as they're coming into Jerusalem, he sent two of his disciples. We don't know which two. Uh, They are unnamed in all three records. No mention of their names is given, but they are given these instructions. Go into the village opposite you. That village is not specifically named. And immediately as you enter it, you will find a coat tied there on which no one has yet ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. Now, in Matthew's account, he said you'll find a donkey tied there and a coat with her. Untie them and bring them to me. Uh, No contradiction, folks. Again, I keep reminding you as you read the text, the critics go to the Bible looking for contradictions in an effort to discredit the text. They want to discredit the text because they don't want to be governed by what it says. And if they can discredit it, then they can ignore it. And so they make all kinds of efforts to find contradictions. The fact of the matter is the full account is contained in the three records of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There was a donkey and her coat. And uh, the disciples that were dispatched are told simply to untie and bring it. And then the text says, If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? You say, The Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it back here. And they went away and found a coat tied at the door outside the street, and they untied it. And some of the bystanders were saying to them, What are you doing? Untying the coat. Now, it's obvious that the bystanders didn't recognize the two disciples had, who had been dispatched, but they simply did as they had been instructed. They spoke to them just as Jesus had told them, and they gave them permission, that is, the bystanders, take the coat, and obviously the coat and the donkey. And they brought the coat to Jesus and put their garments on it, and he sat upon it. And many spread their garments in the road, verse 8, and others spread leafy branches, which they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed after were crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is a reference, by the way, to the 118th Psalm, verse 26. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. Matthew says they cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Luke's account, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And again, though the phrases are not identical, the overall message is the same. 
And because we have crowds accompanying and crowds coming out from Jerusalem to meet, uh, there are numbers of people, and no doubt they're all crying out. And so they would definitely say the same thing, but they might not utilize the same words. And what you have, again, is the full picture by reading all three accounts. And again, you may wonder, why do I keep emphasizing this? It is because people who do not want to be uh, under the demands of Scripture are doing everything within their power to discredit it. They're failing, and they're failing because it is the inspired, authoritative, all-sufficient, and therefore inerrant Word of God. God doesn't contradict Himself. And we have three accounts of this event. We'll get the big picture, the full picture, by looking at all three. This process is simply their way of acknowledging in fulfillment of the 118th Psalm, the Lordship of Jesus. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of David. He is the King of Israel. Now, we know that His kingdom, because we're Bible students, was spiritual in nature. They are not thinking of such a kingdom at this time. And in fact, it's not until Pentecost with the outpouring of the Spirit that even the twelve began to comprehend the nature of the kingdom. But this is the coronation, in essence, of the king as he comes into Jerusalem, acknowledged by the people as the true Messiah. The record continues, And he entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. Looking all around, he departed for Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. The chronology seems to be that this unfolded in the evening of, of Sunday, the first day of the week. Uh, there are some questions, and so we're not going to carve this in stone, but the basic chronology is that the triumphal entry occurred on the first day of the week following the Sabbath, which is Saturday, the seventh day, in having been acknowledged by the people uh, who have cried out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Uh, Hosanna to the prince in heaven. Uh, blessed is the king who comes in, in the name of the Lord. And by the way, the mode of transportation often for kings in the Old Testament was to ride on donkeys. So you can see the correlation here and the fulfillment of it uh, as Jesus does exactly what was expected of a king coming into the city of Jerusalem and the people acknowledge him as such. Again, they don't understand that his kingdom is not of this world yet, John 18, 36. But we get it because we, we're able to look at the whole narrative and, and stand back almost uh, uh, more than 20 centuries and see precisely what God's plan was and how Jesus fulfilled it. At this point, uh, the folks still have uh, more questions and answers, but they know that Jesus is no ordinary man. Now, the next day, which would be, we believe, Monday, in the morning, according to Matthew 21, Mark simply says, and on the next day, when they had departed from Bethany, he became hungry. Jesus became hungry. He was not only the Son of God, he was the Son of Man, and he experienced life as we experience it. He needed to eat. He got hungry as we get hungry. And seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he answered and said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. Now, the reason that he might have expected to find some fruit is that typically the beginning of the fruit forms before the fig tree comes out in leaf. And it was not uncommon to eat that uh, uh, beginnings of the figs uh, from the fig tree before actually it had uh, reached maturity. And Jesus would expect, if it is out in leaf in this fashion, even though it's not the season of figs, that he might find those beginnings of figs, and uh, they're edible, they'd satisfy his hunger. But he didn't. And as a result, he cursed the fig tree. Now, don't lose sight of this story because we'll return to it before chapter 11 closes. Some would say that Jesus did not act appropriately here, that he acted in anger and should not have done so. But again, these are just critics who don't even understand the essence of what this story really is designed to convey. 
it's not so much about a fig tree as it is about the nation of Israel. Maybe you ought to read Isaiah chapter 5 to get a feeling for how sometimes these kinds of things can be metaphors for something far more important. In Isaiah 5, the vineyard represents the nation of Israel. God's care for it, and yet their fruitlessness ultimately will lead to their destruction. Here, the fig tree represents Israel. In Lee, professing to be something that it really isn't. Israel professed to be the true children of God. But on another occasion, you'll find in John 8, Jesus said, your, your father is not Abraham. Your father is the devil. If your father was Abraham, you would believe in me, and you do the things the father desires. The fact is that at least in terms of leadership in the first century Jewish nation, the leaders were far more focused on their human traditions than on the Word of God. Read Matthew 15 for some background there. And so Jesus is simply saying, in a figure, the cursing of the fig tree and its ultimate demise is a metaphor for what ultimately is going to happen to Israel, to Jerusalem, and even the temple. Now, the critics again would say, if he really wanted to do something miraculous here, he should have made the fig tree produce fruit instantly. Could Jesus have done that? I have no doubt that he could have. But he didn't and wouldn't because he never used his powers to satisfy his own personal desires. Look at Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Command these stones to be turned into bread. He would fasted and prayed. Forty-day period. Hunger had to have been overwhelming. And he had the power to turn stones into bread. But he wouldn't utilize that power to satisfy his own personal need. The miracles in the ministry of Christ were done for two reasons. His compassionate heart compelled him to act and help those in need. And the things he did gave validity to the message that he proclaimed. This is in character with what we know about our Lord and should not surprise any of us that this was his response to a fig tree that presented itself to be one thing when it was actually something altogether different. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple. So after cursing the fig tree, he entered Jerusalem and went to the temple and began to cast out those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of, the, of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry goods through the temple. And he began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all of the nations? A quotation from Isaiah 56, verse 7. He says, But you have made it a robber's den. A quotation from Jeremiah 7, verse 11. And the chief priests and the scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him, for they were afraid of him, for all the multitude was astonished at his teaching. Well, the first thing I would point out, and again, the parallels are in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and they tell the same story of Jesus cleansing the temple at the close of his ministry, the final week leading up to his crucifixion. Interestingly, in John's gospel, John tells of an event just like this, at the beginning of his ministry in John 2, following the first miracle in Cana of Galilee, Jesus went into Jerusalem to the temple, and he did exactly what he is doing here at the close of his ministry. Another example where the critics claim a contradiction. But there is no contradiction. What they were doing was very lucrative. Jesus drove them out at the beginning of his ministry, but when Jesus left Jerusalem, and most of his ministry played out in the area of Galilee, in and around Galilee, they were right back to their same old tricks. So when he enters now at the close of his ministry, what does he find? The same environment. And what is his reaction? It is identical. You see, what was taking place is this. Sincere, honest people coming to Jerusalem and to the temple to worship God and follow the law were being cheated. They were being robbed by people in leadership who ought to have known better and should have been doing better. How were they doing this? Well, under the law, sacrifice required the offering of the best, that which was without blemish. They would bring their best, but upon examination, it would be declared unacceptable, and then the offer would be made. We have animals that are acceptable, 
you can purchase them from us, but of course you're going to pay a premium. So they would make money on this sacrificial process. And then people came to pay their annual temple tax. They couldn't use the coinage they brought. That was unacceptable. But we'll be happy to exchange your coinage for acceptable coinage. But of course, again, it's going to be at a price. So they could make a great deal of money and cheat people who were just sincerely wanting to follow the precepts of the law. In Malachi chapter 1, Malachi, the final book of the Old Testament, invited Israel because they were seeking to offer the, blame, the, the lame, the blind, the, the diseased to, in sacrifice to God. And God said no. In essence, through the prophet Malachi, if you tried to give this to the governor to pay your taxes, would he accept it? Well, of course not. Well, why do you think God would accept such? The law had demanded the best, the unblemished. And this was true not just of ordinary average folks, it was also true of the impoverished, and there's the reference to the selling of doves. These would be the sacrifices of the poorest among Israel, because under that system, God never demanded of a man more than he was able to give. If all you can afford is to offer doves, then doves are an acceptable sacrifice, but they were even inflating the price of the doves. They'd turned the house of God, the house of prayer, into a den of thieves, and in righteous indignation, Jesus drove them out of this holy place. It should not happen. They shouldn't even be carrying burdens through. Some have suggested that it, the temple environs served as a shortcut for some engaged in commerce, and Jesus even prohibited that, saying that uh, you ought not be using this facility and these grounds for that purpose. It happened at the beginning of his ministry. It happened at the close of his ministry as well. So let, let's return to our study now in Mark chapter 11, verse 19. And whenever evening came, they would go out of the city. And as they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. So they had been in Jerusalem. They've gone back to Bethany. They're now coming back to Jerusalem. It's daylight now, and they see this fig tree that Jesus had cursed. They're passing by. They saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Now, when a plant typically dies, uh, it doesn't just die overnight like this, wither and, and, and fade away. But when Jesus curses a fig tree, that's exactly what happened. He caught their attention. And Jesus reminded Peter, said to him, uh, and, and being reminded, rather, Peter said to him, Rabbi, behold, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered, saying to him, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, obviously this mountain being the, the Mount of Olives, where Bethany and Bethphage are, are near, uh, located on, if you say to this mountain, uh, Be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it shall be granted him. I submit to you that this is another example of Jesus teaching by means of hyperbole, saying in essence to the true believer, anything that needs to be done, that God desires to be done, can be done. It can be accomplished, but you have to have faith. With faith, you can move mountains, so to speak. The impossible will become possible. Cursing a fig tree and seeing the results overnight is not a big deal when you realize that it is the Son of God and He has all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they shall be granted you. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. Well, the prayer of faith, which can move mountains, is conditioned. God hears the prayers of true believers, and true believers are men and women who understand the essentiality of a forgiving heart 
to share in the forgiveness of God. And so it, it seems to me very appropriate in the context of emphasizing in this wonderful figure, the importance of faith to remind folks of how essential it is for our prayers to be powerful. Uh, they must be according to the will of God, and we must be in the state where we can truly claim to be God's people uh, forgiven and having forgiving hearts. So he offers some instruction here. Whenever you stand pray, what's the appropriate posture for prayer. Some would argue that you ought to be on your knees, and I certainly have no problem with being on one's knees in prayer, expressing in that action humility. But here it seems that the proper posture, as Jesus teaches in this setting, is standing. It may be that uh, this was quite frequently what was done when uh, people prayed publicly and privately. Uh, not mandated. It's not the only posture because posture is not what is important. The physical posture is not what matters. The posture of our heart, humility and forgiveness and faith, these are the things that are required for an effective prayer life. So don't assume that if someone's on their knees that their prayer uh, is more effective than one who is standing or one who is sitting or one who is lying. It's what's in the heart that really matters on the part of the one who is praying. But since standing was one of the means that very typically occurred in prayer, Jesus said, when you're standing uh, and praying, forgive. You see, if, if we're praying to God and we're seeking forgiveness, we had better have a forgiving heart. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also is in heaven may forgive you your trans transgression. So if you want God to be forgiving and merciful, be forgiving and merciful. Jesus on another occasion said, Blessed are the merciful, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's the same kind of concept. To have forgiveness, you must be forgiving. And how often? Uh, on an occasion, Peter asked that question, and Jesus said, Seventy times seven. And he, again, was not saying 490 times. He was saying as often as necessary, we must have forgiving hearts. Hold no grudge against any man. If you want God to look upon you with favor and forgiveness, you have to demonstrate that toward others. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your trespasses or transgressions. It could not be clearer. If you desire God's forgiveness, learn to forgive. There's a passage in the uh, Ephesian epistles, or epistle, pardon me, uh, Paul's letter to Ephesus that just, I, I keep going to it over and over again uh, because it's so powerful and yet so simple. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you, Ephesians 4.32. That's how we ought to live life as a child of God every day. And as we draw our study to a close for this time and reflect on the cursing of the fig tree, what it represented, the ultimate failure of Israel, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, uh, which will come, it comes in AD 70 to be precise, that we see Jesus urging people to come to God in prayer with the right heart not so much the right posture physically, but the right posture spiritually, and that necessitates our forgiving heart. May we be kind and tenderhearted and forgiving to others because God has manifested the same toward us in the person of Jesus. And if we fail in that regard, we will fail to enjoy the benefits and blessings that Jesus provides to genuine disciples. That's where we're going to stop today. Again, we appreciate so much your being with us and trust that the things we've shared have been insightful and certainly faithful to the message of God's Word. If we're faithful to His Word, we cannot help but be benefited and blessed by it. Again, I'm Roger Rush for the 6th in Washington Street's Church of Christ in Marietta, Ohio. We appreciate your taking time to be with us through this medium. Invite you to join us here on the corner of 6th and Washington Streets if you'd like to do that. 
Uh, we encourage your questions and comments. If you have any, let us know, and we'll do our best to provide a Bible answer to your Bible question. And until next time, it's our prayer that God will bless you richly as you seek to know and do His holy will. So until next time, may God's richest blessings be with you.